Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us with for today's webinar, the State of Trade Biden Administration Trade Policy One Year In. Um, before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a sidebar to the right of the main stage. If at any time you need assistance during the live webinar, please message us in the help chat located on the sidebar. You can also ask questions through the Q&A tab throughout the webinar. Your questions will only be visible to you and to our Flexport team. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can, time permitting, but we got a lot to talk about today. Um, a copy of the presentation slides will be dropped in the chat and an on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after the webinar concludes and can be accessed using the same link you were sent earlier. All right, um, and now to keep the lawyers happy, a brief legal note, please keep in mind that all information provided in this session is based on the situation at this current time and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. We always recommend reaching out to a Flexport expert to discuss your particular situation. All right. Now down to, to business. I'm Phil Levy, I'm Chief Economist at Flexport. And with me, we have two savvy Washington trade veterans um, to discuss stuff. I'm, I'm thrilled to have back, Scott, I think this is your second appearance, um, Scott Linscombe, who's the Director of General Economics at Cato's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies, and is a senior visiting lecturer at Duke University Law School, where he's taught a course on international trade law. He previously taught international trade policy as a visiting lecturer at Duke, and before doing all of this, he spent two decades practicing international trade law at White and Case, where he litigated national and multilateral trade disputes and advised multinational corporations on how to handle global trade rules and national regulations. Scott, welcome. Um, Scott's being muted and well-behaved. All right, uh, we'll hear plenty from Scott soon. All right, Ed, Ed Gresser is Vice President and Director for Trade and Global Markets at the Progressive Policy Institute, where he has returned after a distinguished and rather unique stint in government. That's my amendment to his uh, to his bio. Uh, he most recently served as the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Trade Policy and Economics at the USTR. In this position, he led USTR's Economic Research Unit from 2015 to 2021 and chaired the 21 Agency Trade Policy Staff Committee. He was also the recipient of the 2013 Washington International Trade Association Lighthouse Award awarded annually to an individual or group for significant contributions to trade policy. Ed, it's great to have you with us. It's great to be here, thank you. All right, so um, we have a bit of, so that's our all-star lineup. Let me say, move on and say what we're gonna be talking about and give you an idea what we'll cover today. So as background, it's never entirely clear when one should take stock of an administration's progress on trade. It's been about 13 months President Biden took off that. And it's been about 11 months since the U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, was confirmed by the Senate. On average, that's a year. So it's a nice round number and it gives us an excuse to look at what's happened. Um, I'd also make the argument, and my guests can disagree later if they like, that the first year of a presidential term is especially important for trade policy to the extent that you're going to do stuff with trade agreements. Um, that they're an important part of that policy. Um, there may be a somewhat narrow window to negotiate them and complete them, given all the legal requirements. We'll get into that a bit surrounding agreements and the political constraints that can make it hard to finish something in an election year. We'll get to all that in the specifics. Um, but I think we can start with our two very general points that one can't really argue, which is one, President Trump had a very different trade policy from any recent predecessor. And two, President Biden had been broadly critical of President Trump's policies on the campaign trail, and at times was specifically critical of his trade policies though that, would, that was hardly the core of his uh, campaign platform. So what we're gonna be asking is across a whole range of issues, how much has changed? So the issues that we're gonna take on, it's a sort of tour de raison, all this. We're gonna look at what's going on with China in section 301, um, the, what's going on, the big trade war uh, with lots of tariffs. Then we'll turn to Europe, Japan and section 232. These were the steel and aluminum tariffs on national security grounds. We're gonna ask, what has happened and what might happen with, I put regional trade agreements, probably more accurate term is preferential trade agreements since they can stretch across regions, but things such as the CPTPP, USMCA and so forth. Um, then we're gonna ask whatever happened to multilateralism such as the WTO. And um, we're gonna conclude by trying to think uh, what the Biden administration actually means by what it describes as the center of its approach, which is to have a worker centric trade policy. Um, they put out some material on that 
but uh, we'll make of it what we can. So time permitting, let's turn to Q&A. We're gonna get started as we usually do by asking you all to weigh in. Um, we've got a very general question about how you see this past year in trade policy. And I will acknowledge right up front that we're asking you to compare four years of President Trump with one year of President Biden, so you can adjust your answers accordingly. But here are the choices um, for the poll. That the, um, do you think when comparing President Biden and President Trump on trade issues, that A, President Biden has gotten more accomplished in a good way, B, President Biden has gotten more accomplished in a problematic way, C, eh, they have different styles, but the substance is pretty similar, D, President Trump got more accomplished in a good way, or E, President Trump got more accomplished in a prob problematic way. So we're trying to be as even-handed as we can here. Um, so let me ask you all to register your opinions. Um, I'll give you a little time to do that. You can vote. Um, essentially, who got more accomplished and was that a good thing or a bad thing? Or did they end up pretty much the same with C being pretty much the same? All right, we've got a whole bunch of votes in. There are no wrong answers. Um, and not only that, we can't even see what you all are saying. So go crazy. Um, all right, so what we are seeing is, ah, interesting. Um, so the, the 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 sort of two in very close uh, range as more votes come in, but I'm seeing that C appears to be in the lead, at least for the moment, with 36% and E with 35%. So between they have different styles, but the substance is pretty similar to President Trump got more accomplished, but in a problematic way. Well, that'll give us some good stuff to talk about. So um, it's, it's helpful. Thank you all for participating. It's, it's great to know what, what you're thinking. We'll come back with a couple more polls as we go along, but let's jump into the issues. Um, let's turn to China. Um, and this is obviously a, a central preoccupation of both administrations, both the Trump and the Biden, and many legislators as well. Um, President Trump was very blunt in his criticism of past negotiating strategies. Um, and I think there were arguably two central novel features to his approach, the use of tariffs under Section 301, um, and then two, having a trade agreement that came out of this, which relied heavily and tried to avoid ambiguity by sticking with numerical targets, the so-called phase one trade agreement. Um, under President Biden, the tariffs are still there. Numerical targets haven't been. We can see on the next slide, actually, um, we put up some data about this. Uh, prepared by Chris Rogers, our, our principal supply chain economist. And what you see here, the, the dark lines are what actually happened, the solid lines. The dotted ones were the numerical ambitions under the phase one agreement. Um, Scott, let me start with you. And first, you don't have to accept my characterization of all this. Did I characterize the policies accurately? And how do you compare what we've seen under President Trump and, and now under President Biden? Whoops, can't, what? are you muted or, let's see. No, I'm not. There you go, I, mm -hmm. now I hear you. You hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, good, okay. So um, I think that uh, you characterize things relatively well uh, overall. Um, the The only thing I would add is that um, the, the Trump administration's policy also, especially towards the end, uh, was starting to lean heavily on sanctions and export controls. Um, that is important in things like semiconductors, of course, given the you know global chip shortage. Um, but also uh, a really what I would just call a frontal assault approach to trade and geopolitics, in that there was not much subtlety in uh, President Trump's uh, actions or his rhetoric. Whereas past administrations, you know, tried this approach of quiet diplomacy, trying to you know, nudge the Chinese in the right direction without going just, uh, you know, full frontal attack mode. Um, now, uh, as I've written, I think that that the Trump administration's approach was mostly a failure. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I don't think just because of the missing the phase one targets. Now, we can talk about whether it's wise to have phase one targets uh, at all, uh, particularly when some of them are in uh, for energy goods with wildly fluctuating prices and you, you, uh, the targets were in dollars, probably not that smart. Um, but, you know, I think that more broadly, um, the phase one deal was about getting China to change behavior on key areas, intellectual property, 
um, to liberalize in other key sectors, not just on goods and things like financial services, and also to try to adjust Chinese trade policy, economic policy, geopolitics, and the rest. Um, and I think in that broader context, not just on the phase one targets, the deal was was a failure. Um, you know, we've uh, the tariffs imposed a lot of costs for the U.S. economy and for the Chinese economy too. Um, in it caused all sorts of uh, issues with exclusions and uncertainty, and there are tons of economic studies there. Um, but also, I mean, let's face it, the U.S.-China relationship is in a much worse place today, I think, geopolitically, human rights, foreign policy, trade policy, and the rest than it was four years ago. Um, now, moving to Biden, um, not much has changed. Uh, the, some of the rhetoric has changed. Uh, President Biden has made some initial movements related to getting other allies on board. President Trump was a, a very uh, gung-ho unilateralist. Um, and so I think that, you know, if you look at, at, at there, that's about it, though. The tariffs all remain in place. Uh, the phase one deal has, is technically still around, um, although, you know, it's a two-year, we had these two-year export targets. Um, and there has not been, I don't think, a really uh, serious look at changing course. And I think that is purely, not, not purely, but I think a lot of it is politics. Um, regardless of whether the tariffs make any sense, regardless of whether sticking with this uh, phase one deal makes any sense, uh, the fact is that the administration is quite convinced that China is essentially political kryptonite, and that moving on these issues would be very bad for Democrats in the midterms and for President Biden or the Vice President Harris, whoever will be the Democratic nominee in 2024. And so that's essentially, I think, you know, really where, where we are and, and probably uh, where we're, we're going to be going forward. I, and then the last thing I would just add is that um, a really, I think, key sign of where the administration is on a lot of this was that they are in court uh, vigorously defending Section 301, the law under which uh, these tariffs were imposed and the, the actions, these actions were taken, um, and the president's authority to take these types of actions under, under Section 301 and maintain them in the current scope. So I think that gives you a pretty good idea that they're not uh, planning to change course anytime soon. No, that's, that's very helpful. And, and, it, and it's a very good reminder that this did all start with substantially greater ambition. It wasn't just the numerical targets, as you say. It was much more things. And how do you see this? How do you see the, the history? And are you surprised by the approach the Biden administration has taken? Um, great questions. Um, I see a lot of it in uh, ways that are quite similar to the way Scott sees it. Um, a couple of things I would observe. Uh, one is that uh, Mr. Trump and um, using unilateralism and tariffs and uh, verbal abuse also used a lot of flattery in uh, towards the Chinese president. Um, and, and that was also an unsuccessful uh, uh, um, tactic. Um, I agree very much. This agreement hasn't produced um, all that much. Um, if you look at the tariffs, we had 13 billion a year in tariffs on Chinese goods 2017. Now we have about 50 odd billion. Uh, if you look at the Chinese share of the U.S. market, there's been a dent in it. Um, they had 21% of goods imports four years ago, and now they have 18. So there's been a, a kind of a swab of imports that has been kind of pushed from China into Vietnam principally and a few other Asian countries. So you can definitely see there have been some real world changes that came from this, but they're mo mostly um, changing the source of about $100 billion worth of imports, which isn't nothing, but it's not huge. And uh, higher tariffs on uh, goods is uh, really a, is a way of taxing mostly American manufacturers and construction firms. Most of the China 301 tariffs are industrial inputs, whereas most of the permanent system is um, on retailers and families. So it has changed the nature of the tariff system significantly to the extent these stay in place, it about doubled its size and shifted it from mainly consumer tariffs to about half consumer tariffs and about half um, business and industry taxation. Um, but in terms of uh, changing Chinese policies, 
I don't think it's been very successful. In terms of getting um, China to buy more things, uh, China is quite a large importer and remains quite a large importer, um, worldwide and of American products. Some of the effects of the purchasing targets were to get China to again buy soybeans and airplanes, which they had stopped buying only because of the 301 case. Um, others, you know, you know, I think agriculture has turned up a bit. I mean, China definitely has a lot of agricultural import space. Uh, the services part of the agreement was very unrealistic, and I could see it at the time that no country had ever reached a level of services import growth that the uh, agreement called for. So you could say this isn't going to work. And uh, so what's happened is we had an initial set of you know, 301 case based on cyber theft and forced uh, technology transfer. There was quite a professional damage assessment done by CEA where um, Dill used to work and USTR's economics office. That was about $50 billion. Um, the rest of the tariffs are tit for tats and, and mutual retaliations. Um, so I think this hasn't been very productive. As Scott mentioned, if you look at the US-China relationship overall, you know what is the state of human rights in China? What is the security relationship between the two countries like? It's not better. Um, it may be that China is on a you know, fairly well-determined course set by the government that isn't all that influenced by the things that foreigners do. Um, but you know, but this didn't turn it around for sure. The Biden administration has acknowledged that this has not succeeded. Uh, I think it is well worth reading Ambassador Tai's speech in October to at the CSIS, where she goes through some of the history of the relationship, some of the challenges. She had seen growing while she was at USTR as a, as a lawyer. She was the lead um, China negotiator. She was quite very, very well informed on these issues. So she set out a series of problems that the agreement either did not succeed in addressing or didn't try to address. So there is a, she, there is a, a roadmap for the administration to take um, looking forward. Uh, I'll sort of decline to speculate about politics and how electoral things uh, interplay with this. But um, there is a, looking forward, a, the opportunity to have a, a different agenda and one that uh, might be more focused on the, ch the problems and, um, and economic challenges in the relationship than I think this uh, the phase one agreement turned out to be. Yeah. So it's, yeah, but is the interesting thing is that on the campaign trail, President Biden did, did, uh, React in many of the ways that both of you described. That you know, described these are taxes on consumers and so forth. Um, does he have the ability? You, I, I won't sort of ask you to sort of do political handicapping. But let me put it this way: Should we expect any sharp? Ch and we'll do this sort of lightning round to conclude this. We got the rest of the world to get to, but should we expect any sharp change based on, say, what Ambassador Tai said in October or what you know of things as we look forward? Are these tariffs going to stay in place, or do we see a new direction? Um, Scott, quick answer. See no, no real change. Um, I, I really haven't seen any significant uh, indication from the administration, whether it's on the tariff exclusions and the resistance there, or in the courts, that they're going to change course on the tariffs anytime soon. Ed, um, I tend to agree with Scott. Um, I think two things to be aware of. Uh, my perception of the administration, and maybe some of this we'll talk about in the next uh, round. Yeah. One is that they see foreign policy very much through a lens of competition with uh, several great powers, particularly Russia and China, that are disenchanted or never were satisfied with the US rules based order. And in order to make, you know, you know, succeed in this uh, need to have policies that will have consensus among U.S. friends and allies and also consensus at home. And uh, I think uh, China policy generally and in trade will develop secondarily to those uh, goals, uh, rebuilding relationships with the traditional U.S. allies and having a trade policy that will have um, some degree of consensus within the United States. So that actually makes for a very nice segue, thank you, to our to our next topic, which is um, let's talk about the part where we call our allies national security risks. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's being a little bit snide on my part. 
So let's talk about Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, um, which the Trump administration, in it's kind of a novel way, uh, used to, to get authority to impose tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum. And among the things, so first, claiming national security as a rationale was a novelty. But then there was also the part here where this started hitting a lot of nations who were traditionally thought of as close allies of the United States in, in political and in, in geostrategic terms, such as Europe and Japan. We, that actually, we have had a development fairly recently from the Biden administration, where they have renegotiated some of those approaches, not blocking them or stopping them, but, but altering them and replacing tariffs with some uh, with a mechanism called a tariff rate quota. So Ed, maybe you can tell us how we should think about this, um, how unusual this was to rely on a national security argument, whether you were surprised this rationale stayed in place and what's a TRQ anyways. Okay, well, um, I kind of defer a lot to Scott on this as a, a trade lawyer and he will be, I think, uh, you know, quite capable of correcting and, um, and sharpening my, whatever I have to say about this, but I'd say a couple of things. Uh, one is that there is uh, in the Del Delta and the GATT agreement a, a longstanding exception that allows countries to take action on the basis of national security. My personal impression of this, I, I don't think it had been used in the past. My impression is it would be hypothetically government of Ukraine could ban Russian investment on the grounds of national security as uh, we are in an emergency situation and we do not have confidence in Russian investment investors here. I mean, that, that's sort of what comes to mind to me as a kind of predictable use of national security. The Trump administration argument was the U.S. needs to have an indigenous steel um, manufacturing capacity. This is a basic industry that serves a whole lot of other parts of the economy. Um, they had a faith in tariffs as a way to um, build up uh, the steel industry. There's been a lot of experience with that in the past and hasn't uh, always paid off. But um, I think that it's definitely quite offensive to Europe and Japan, US allies, to Canada and Mexico as well. Um, but there, I mean, the argument was not that EU is a, a per se a threat to us, but that we need to have US based steel manufacturing and aluminum capacity. I would have thought personally that if there were a real threat to those industries, that that's what the safeguard law is for. So I thought that the use of the national security law was, as you say, novel and odd and uh, uh, not something that I would have adv advocated. And then how, how about the Biden? You, you were just telling us that the Biden administration was oh, yes, okay. relations with allies. And yes, yet uh, we're still calling them national security threats. Um, no, I don't think they're calling them national security threats. I think they do have, they do share with uh, the last administration in the sense that there's not enough manufacturing in the United States and that uh, you know, some, some uh, policy activity and uh, in some cases industrial policy and in some cases uh, trade policy will help to shore up um, U.S industrial base. Uh, they have worked out agreements with the EU and with Japan to have a, a certain share of steel coming duty free and the rest of it be sub, uh, subject to a quota. And so I think uh, this is very much in line with their hopes to rebuild relationships and confidence with US allies. But it is also um, it's kind of a clunky set of agreements. And it's not clear how well it worked, but it also reflects the strong desire they have that uh, trade policy should not be a, a large headache within the Democratic Party, as was the case under President Obama and President Clinton. And so th they do put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, work into getting the Democratic Party and constituencies on board. And this uh, sometimes involves trade-offs that lead to rather you know, clunky agreements. Okay, thank you. So, Scott, I know you weren't a fan of the original action. Are you all good now with the system of TRQs, tariff rate quotas? Not at all. No, I, I think, <laughs> I think it's a. Uh, I, well, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback off Ed's last comment. I agree with 
pretty much everything he said, but that, um, well, this is a classic case of balancing uh, political realities, namely uh, getting the support of the United Steelworkers Union and some very uh, politically powerful steelmakers in places like Pennsylvania, um, getting them on board. And of course, their backers, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown in Ohio, for example, um, to maintain their support for other domestic legislative priorities and all that kind of stuff. So politics on one side, political or sorry, geopolitical and economic realities on the other side. Um, I mean, you start with the fact that, and, and look, full disclosure, when back when in my trade lawyer days, I, I actually participated in the original 232 steel investigation. So I know this stuff like the back of my hand, but I'll just note that the United States steel industry before the tariffs were imposed had about a 70% US market share. They were not dying off. They had strong financials. They had gone through a bit of a mini recession in 15 and 16 with a, like a lot of manufacturers, but they were doing just fine. They also of course benefited by uh, from hundreds of anti-dumping and countervailing duty measures uh, protecting discrete areas of the steel supply chain. So the, the case for a global tariff to protect the steel industry was, was pretty bogus, uh, particularly when in the early days it applied to Canada, who is, Canada is literally part of our, our defense industrial base. Um, and a, a lot of steel makers are integrated across the border, uh, but, and Mexico, and then all of these other allies. So, um, I think the TRQs, uh, again, d really defy that economic reality. For example, uh, the quota, the duty-free parts of the quota are significantly below historical averages pre-tariff, meaning that there's really still a tariff applied. Um, it's just going to be applied to a, a smaller amount of product. But the other big thing is anybody who deals with quotas knows is the complexity of all of this. Um, on the EU side, the quotas are divided up by member state and by product, looking at thousands of different quota levels applied quarterly. The Japanese only have about 50 or 60 of these things. Um, and that type of complexity just further confounds the market and is going to ensure that prices in the United States stay pretty high, significantly higher right now than uh, prices in Europe or the world export prices, which of course puts U.S. manufacturers at a huge disadvantage. But look, you know, the, the Biden administration is, is clearly trying to balance all of that, trying to balance with, uh, you know, trying to get Europe and Japan and other allies to be happier about a situation that they are clearly ticked off about, trying to get them to lift, uh, in the Europeans' case, some retaliatory, retaliatory tariffs on U.S. exports um, with, again, balancing it with the political realities. Um, the only thing I would add, however, is that um, I think the the Koreans, South Korea is a huge, uh, I think, problem right now in this whole system because the Koreans in the Trump administration days agreed to a hard quota um, that is, again, way below historical levels. South Korea is a very important regional ally. And the South Korean government, I think, is pretty ticked about they are now uh, very much on the outside looking in, and apparently the Biden administration isn't giving much the time of day. And I think that's, uh, you know, going to be a, a potential thorn going forward until it's uh, worked out. And then the other big one, of course, is the UK. But I imagine they're going to work out something like the Europeans and, and Japanese got. No, that's an excellent point. Actually, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see a little bit of data on all of this, where this is showing what happened to um, who was who was bringing in 232 steel imports. It doesn't highlight Korea, as you said, but you do see there's been some shifting around as various deals have been struck. And it's one feature of this approach when one does quotas and allowing certain amounts, which is our general belief had been, you set, say, a tariff rate if you need to. It's supposed to be uniform, at least in a multilateral system across countries. And you buy from whoever sells you the best stuff at the, at the lowest prices. Here you end up with sort of allocation. And so part of the history we saw here was uh, North American partners, Mexico and Canada, providing, presumably Canada predominantly, providing substantially more of these imports. I want to, bef before we leave this, let me just sort of put uh, one question um, to each of you uh, for, for a quick round. So Scott, the question to you is, Ed made the good point, which is, you know, you look at the GATT and there is an exception there that says you can do national security things. If it's on the books, what's so wrong about using it? 
And then Ed, my question to you, which you can answer right after Scott answers his, is does this approach do what the, the Biden administration's approach do what they want to do in terms of clearing the decks and having now better commercial relations or better relations with Europe and with Japan? We've only touched on part of those relations. But first, Scott, let's, what's wrong with using national security if it's in the book? So GATT Article 21, the big national security exception, it's very broad and discretionary. Um, and it thus was not the subject of really any uh, previous litigation a little bit way back in like the 60s. Um, but the other big thing was that it was used sparingly. Um, it was a bit of a third rail of international trade law. Um, and it was really not used for straight up economic protectionism like these 232s, the steel and aluminum 232s were. And that has really caused problems at the World Trade Organization. Um, dispute settlement panels that were constituted to look at these tariffs, they don't want to rule on this case because of the really significant geopolitical implications of telling countries what is in their essential security interests. Well, the Trump administration didn't care, and I think that's a another real problem with the 232s and the 232 model. Um, I would just add that the other part that's buried in there is also the, the use of quotas very much looked down upon um, at at the WTO for the reasons you describe, and for a lot of political economy reasons, you know, giving out quota rents uh, is pretty nice, um, but it, it raises all sorts of, you know, as you said, economic and issues. Um, but that uh, another part of this, you know, you're not supposed to, there, countries are not supposed to agree to quantitative export restraints or quantitative agreements generally, and, and yet they have. And so that's putting even more pressure on top of the national security stuff. And that's that we're going to come back to that talking about the, the state of agreements and what's happening with them. So that's a great um, preview. But first, Ed, you told us before that a principal goal of the Biden administration was to have cooperation with the, the right kind of countries that we saw as the ones who sort of had a similar vision for an international order. Europe and Japan would certainly count. Do you think that these restructurings accomplish that task? Um, not in a, not in of themselves. I guess before I go to that, I would say... Um... Scott's point about the very sparing use of the national security exception is a really important one. That yeah. It is a very big um, loophole, if you want to use it as a loophole. And I think it is important to see it as something you use in extremists when your country is in danger, not as a economic management tool. That, you know, if you want to have a policy for tariffs on an industry, that's what the safeguard agreement is there for. Um, so, uh, Going back to your question, in and of themselves, these agreements with Europe and Japan, I think, bring down the temperature. I, mean, I don't think either of them are fully satisfied with them, and for reasons that Scott has laid out pretty well. I think both of them feel this is a, a positive step. They're you know, aware that the Biden administration has domestic politics as well, and that there's some constraints on it. Um, so I think you, you have to take this set of agreements in the context of whatever may come out of the uh, USU Trade and Technology Council, whatever the next steps are with Japan and with uh, the, as we learn more about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And um, I think the, the general sense, I, I do think is correct that the U.S. allies feel the Biden administration is serious about rebuilding relations with them, that the president is personally serious about the, about this, and that you know, there's going to be some areas where they're not totally satisfied on trade. But uh, I think they will say the administration is hard is in the right place, and a lot of its actions are going in the right direction. Okay, that's helpful. All right, it's time to get back to our audience. Um, and because we've, we've already mentioned a bit about how, you know, what whether free trade agreements have shaped some of these flows, um, side deals, or the multilateral system, we're turning that direction. Let's go to a poll. Um, so we are now going to ask, as we look forward to these things, um, when you think about possible trade deals the U.S. might strike, so what the Biden administration might do, which is closest to your view? Is it that, A, the most important thing is that the U.S. join the CPTPP, that's the successor agreement, um, in Asia that followed on the TPP. B, we should really focus on digital trade, not on conventional trade deals. C, it's most important that the U.S. conclude its deal with the United Kingdom. D, 
the U.S. should focus on a multilateral deal, something at the World Trade Organization, the WTO, or E, trade deals are overrated. Let's stick with what we have. So let me ask you all, many of you have voted. Let me ask the rest of you to register your opinion, and then we'll compare what happened under uh, the Trump administration and where we see the Biden administration going and what's happened on this. So thank you for those who have voted. We'll sort of keep the poll open for a little bit more. It looks like, interestingly, um, I, I don't know whether, this is gonna, whether the Biden administration will be happy with this, but uh, by far the leaders so far are D, which is the U.S. should focus on a multilateral deal with the WTO, or A, it's time for the U.S. to join the CPTPP. Um, all right, I'm not going to make, uh, Scott and Ned, I'm not going to make you guys actually vote on this, but <laughs> thank you for everyone who has. This is very interesting. Um, we actually got about almost 50% saying, let's be multilateral, which we almost never hear about multilateral. We're going to take each of these topics in turn. We're going to think about preferential, which has been a lot more active, and then we we will turn to multilateral. We're going to listen. Um, but let's let's move on and let's talk about um, preferen re regional trade agreements or preferential trade agreements, if you will. Um, and let's move to the next slide. Uh, all right. So prior to President Trump coming in, negotiating pre preferential trade agreements was really a centerpiece of administration's trade policies. And that's been true, I think, since the 1990s um, with NAFTA. So we saw multiple agreements under President Clinton, under President Bush, under President Obama. It was not at all unusual to see agreements that were started in one administration and concluded in the next. We could come up with a number of, or passed in the next. We could come up with a number of examples of that. President Trump broke pretty sharply from that tradition by rejecting the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, right upon taking office. He then did some rewrites of existing agreements, Korea and NAFTA, with the NAFTA rewrite being passed as the USMCA. And then he launched some negotiations uh, in a sort of distinctive style with the United Kingdom and others. The, one of the keys to this, um, and we'll, we'll turn to our legal assistants, um, it, so Scott, this is on you, is we, we know that trade promotion authority has lapsed. We want to know why we care. Um, President Biden has not seemed anywhere near as interested in pursuing trade agreements, but they have started talking about this thing called an Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and we've recently had some details released. So Scott, where do we stand with free trade agreements as a tool now, and what change do you perceive, if any? So I, I mean, I... Yeah. I don't think we have a lot of uh, real comprehensive free trade agreements in our in our near future. Um, the the Biden administration has been pretty clear that they do not want the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to be a comprehensive FTA. Now, the new strategy does have some indications of of broader and deeper engagement, but. Um, the, the the real tell there, I think, is the the lack of uh, any mention of the of the TPP or now CPTPP, which is a pretty in, at least on substance. And again, it's different from politics, but this, on substance, there is a, a pretty clear opening there. The CPT CPTPP members have been very clear that they would love the United States to come back. Now the United States has to renegotiate its entry. Um, because uh, once the United States withdrew, they now have to rejoin. That that would take some work, but compared to starting from scratch, um, there uh, that's an obvious place to start. Uh, and uh, you know the TPP was originally meant to be at least in part about engaging in the Asia Pacific region, acting as a bit of a counterweight to China's growing economic and geopolitical gravity in the region, and all that jazz. Um, but there really doesn't appear to be um, much interest, at least overtly, before the midterms. Um, maybe that'll change after the midterms a bit, especially depending on um, who who retakes Congress. Um, the congressional Republicans have started uh, hinting at uh, TPP engagement or CPTPP engagement. So maybe there's something there um, in in November, December of this year. Uh, but as you noted, uh, trade promotion authority is a big thing that needs to be figured out, I think. Um, so for those on the uh, call who don't know, 
you know, trade promotion authority is essentially the vehicle by which the United States uh, negotiates and, and most importantly implements trade agreements because it reflects a balance between Congress and the executive branch and of the constitution. Congress has tariff power, the president has foreign affairs power. TPA is kind of the handshake deal between them uh, and it allows trade agreements that the president negotiates to get fast tracked through Congress. Now without that, theoretically the United States can negotiate and conclude trade agreements but uh, getting them through Congress would be extremely difficult. I believe there's only one US FTA, the Jordan, US Jordan FTA that proceeded without TPA. TPA is a really integral part. And it's really important also because trading partners wanna know that they're getting the best deal, that Congress isn't gonna change the deal. And so they, they really value TPA too. So without it, um, you know, the, the Biden administration can make some efforts on things like digital trade or supply chain resiliency or something but you're not gonna see the deep type of engagement that we've had in the past. The, and it should be noted, the deep type of engagement that our regional allies in the Asia Pacific really, really want. So, um, you know, the, this Indo-Pacific economic framework stuff is nice, but it's not nearly as deep as, as what uh, the folks out there want. So Ed, let me pose this to you. So Scott described sort of a divergence where our allies and, and the people in key regions really want this sort of deep engagement and it's getting less and less support um, in, in U.S. administrations. Do you see that the same way? Um, I think it's a, still, a, still an open question, still policy and development. If you, you know, I've read the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework document, um, there's a lot of principles in it. There's a nod toward digital um, trade. There's a nod toward free and open and fair trade in the region. Um, yet to be seen how this will be fleshed out. I think fundamentally the document says we and our Asia Pacific allies share values and common interests. We would like to proceed with them on the basis of those values and interests. So that is a quite big departure from the Trump administration, which was more like we are the victims of our uh, tricky and untrustworthy unreli- so-called allies. Uh, we have been cheated and we're going to get our own back. So, I mean, I think that does point to at least a big diver- big divergence in the way the administrations are thinking. Um, I, I think as both of you mentioned, the TPP is the largest, uh, most comprehensive agreement, uh, reflects a lot of American policy goals uh, negotiated out in 2013, 14, 15, and 16. Um, it's also quite controversial. And I think one of the administrations principles is they don't want to have a confrontation on trade within the party as happened uh, very much over TPP. So that's the sort of choice that they're uh, faced with. You know, is, is it okay to go back to TPP or is that going to lead to another kind of uh, big intra-democratic argument and maybe not to a successful agreement? Is there a different sort of agreement model that is uh, contrast in some ways and would get more consensus? Or uh, is there some other thing? I mean, if I look ahead, if just thinking purely as okay, trade and flows and what does the U.S. need, um, right now, the U.S. is doing fairly well. We had a very large jump in exports last year. We had a large jump in imports, you know, quite big trade boom as we were getting out of the, the depths of COVID. Will that last? I don't know. If you look ahead, you see, I think, a couple of things that are quite worrisome. Uh, one is that um, you have TPP in effect, uh, or CPTPP. That means some substantial amount of tariff uh, differentials against American exporters and some diversion of trade away from the United States. That will be amplified by um, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This is a 15-country agreement with China and Korea and Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the 10 um, ASEAN members. And that uh, came into effect January 1st and will continually be uh, cutting away tariffs internally. So at a a kind of simple and non-comprehensive level, we're going to see more tariff discrimination against U.S. exporters, um, against chemicals, against farm products, against cars and so forth than than we now see. Um, In the digital area, there is a a similar phenomenon. very strong, very focused efforts by China to design a 
you know, digital policy framework that is not at all consistent or with the U.S. Um, sort of traditional approach of open data flows, for, you know, free flow of information, yeah, those sorts of things. And so, uh, when we are thinking about agreements and administrations thinking about agreements, we're doing so from, I think, a short-term position, which is fairly good, that there isn't really an emergency, but there's a, several long-term problems that are going to uh, get uh, more significant with the passage of time. And so these are going to be important decisions. And you know, at some point, you may have to accept some domestic stress to secure international goals, or you'll at least be faced with a, a choice between them. Well, that's, that's a very good point. And actually, so Scott, let me give you the opportunity to quickly close us out on this issue, where Ed has described how there's some laudable goals, some important things in like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There's concerns about having rifts within a party, some of the political things. Do you see from, say, a legal standpoint or somebody who's sort of exp as an experienced analyst and observer this, are there alternatives? Are there ways that one can do this without having sort of the contentious debates we've had in the past? Or... Or do we have to make the kind of trade-offs that I, I just talked about at some point in the future? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really see much of a way to get around having some uh, political discord um, because uh, you have a pretty staunch opposition from, say, United Auto Workers Union, Steel Workers Union, and, and you have strong Democratic constituencies. And then I would say some on the environmental side as well that uh, really see this type of deep engagement uh, as problematic. Um, now, there are some potential fixes, uh, for example, the types of rules of origin in the USMCA that the Trump administration negoti negotiated. Um, uh, the, the unions really liked those um, in the automotive space because they insured a lot of domestic content. But getting the CPTPP members to agree to that, I mean, that's very, very tough outside of Canada and Mexico, which are so reliant on the U.S. market. So I think I think at some point, you know, you are going to need a bit of a sister soldier moment on on this stuff uh, to because because you this type of comprehensive engagement necessarily involves economic competition. And some folks uh, don't want that. And, and our older demographic is going to appreciate you going old school with the sister soldier moment. Yeah, OK, sure. cool. Well, we're, we're going to go old school because once upon a time. Next slide, please. The, the sort of the paradigm for how one really ought to conduct trade policy was that you should the, the goal was having a nice multilateral rules based system that was what was supposed to cover everything as we discussed earlier it was a way to um, make sure things were even handled let's go to the next slide um, the culmination of this was the World Trade Organization in the mid of, of the 1990s which built on decades of liberalization um, China was incorporated into this system I think it was 2001. Um, you, you had all this, there were really, I would argue, two big features of the system. One, it was supposed to allow negotiations. It was a place where countries could get together and talk through concerns that they had. And two, it was specifically a place where they could resolve disputes and disagreements in an orderly way that wouldn't th let things spiral out of control um, in, in terms of this. Um, so, Ed, we're going to have to be concise because we've got too much to talk about in too little time. But let me just ask you, is the multilateral dream dead? Uh, not dead, um, but uh, not healthy either. Uh, you know, the, as you say, the WTO created 19, beginning in 1995. There were a number uh, of uh, agreements done in the 1990s. Um, the Doha round that uh, you watched closely in the first Bush administration um, did not work out. Uh, that reflected a really deep division between the United States, Europe, a few other countries on one hand, and India, South Africa, Brazil, sort of quietly backed by China on the other about who needed to do, um, do most uh, in terms of cutting tariffs, in terms of uh, whether there should be special and differential treatment for poorer countries or large emerging economies or what, whatever. Um, there was a lot of activity from 2000 through mid 2010s on accessions of new countries into the WTO. 
that process is more or less complete with some uh, relatively minor exceptions. Uh, the Obama administration taking office in 2009 concluded Doha around wasn't going to work, wanted to focus on some smaller parts of it, uh, did succeed with the trade facilitation agreement, uh, had a very small information technology agreement and did not succeed with an environmental goods agreement. Those are two sort of you know, fairly unambitious tariff cutting uh, proposals. Um, dispute settlement, um, 610 disputes over these past uh, 30, you know, 28 odd years. It's quite a lot, very busy, but now, um, uh, as I noted, the appellate body is frozen because the Trump administration didn't want to appoint anyone to it, and that's carried on up to the Biden administration. The uh, designate ambassador to the WTO, Maria Pagan, is a very, very talented person. Uh, very energetic, very widely respected, both within the U.S. and internationally. I think uh, I think the Biden administration will be wanting to find a way through the appellate body issues, but uh, I don't see as yet that the division between um, sort of large established developed economies and large powerful emerging economies has closed. And the you know. If you don't have a shared vision of where multilateralism should take us, then it's hard to uh, then it's hard to uh, reach agreements. And so, you know, I think we do have good people there. The WTO Director General, Dr. Ngozi, is very talented and also I uh, think widely liked and respected. There are there's probably an achievable set of goals as we're looking for the next ministerial conference, uh, fishery subsidies, and a few other things. But um, until there's more convergence of large goals, and uh, in particular, probably now between the US and China, then we have uh, this is a kind of difficult situation. So thank you. That, that's a that's a very good comprehensive analysis. Scott, um, you saw this was the almost majority pick from our from our listeners and sort of where they wanted to see action. Ed gave us at least some reasons for hope. Are you hopeful for multilateralism? Uh, no, um, but uh, but I think I think the the pollsters are right. The, they're the folks taking the poll are, are right. That I mean, if I could snap my fingers and fix one thing, it would be fixing the multilateral system. But for a lot of the reasons that Ed described, um, it doesn't really appear to be anything. Any that it doesn't appear to be any fix coming anytime soon. Um, I would just add two things. One. Uh, I'm really severely disappointed with the Biden administration on the appellate body. Um, it seemed to me to be a very easy fix and a fig leaf that really wouldn't do much in the way of um, harming U.S. interests or anything like that. Um, and the U.S. is the lone holdout. This is not like the Doha round where there were the blame could be cast around to everyone. I mean, this is really... The, the, the U.S. and a U.S. problem hobbling the appellate body. And quite frankly, it goes against our own interests in terms of a lot of disputes, one on sugar subsidies recently in India, um, that have now been kind of fired off into the void and not resolved because uh, the appellate body is is currently defunct. So I'm not very hopeful. And, and again, I think the key is that Nobody wants to give on the big issues. The United States doesn't want to give on trade remedies reform or on agricultural subsidies. India doesn't want to give on certain market access, China on special and differential treatment uh, and services liberalization and on and on and on. And until there's a kind of first mover, uh, I think we're stuck. Now, I am hopeful that little things can get done. Um, environmental goods agreement, for example, seems like a total no brainer. Um, and other plurilateral agreements of the willing on discrete issues seem to be doable. I think the WTO remains essential as a baseline set of rules, but those rules need a dispute settlement arbiter, which again is broken, and we need the United States to stop uh, holding that up. Well, well uh, clear-eyed, <laughs> if, if not optimistic, um, and I can't say I disagree with you. All right. Um, we got lots. To, actually, I, we'd be remiss in not getting to our last topic. So I want to move on, even though there's certainly more interesting things to say. We want to do one more quick poll and then take on the, and the poll and the topic are um, when you think of a worker centric trade deal. And this is supposed to be central to the Biden administration's approach. Does this mean a different choices of trading partners than one did in the past? 
Does it mean striking deals that involve less market opening? Does it mean that there will be specific clauses in there to protect labor in deals? D, that these are really the same deals, just with different marketing. Um, or E, it's an excuse for not striking deals at all. All right, so there you have it. This is to give you a chance. I would. There's a little bit of mystery around what this means. Ed is going to clarify everything in just a minute or so. No, I'm just kidding. He's going to give it his best shot. But I want to find out in terms of where, where you think right now. This is something the Biden administration has spoken of extensively. It is a principal central tenet that they want to pursue work a worker-centric trade policy. Um, we, t so what what is your impression having heard that? What does that mean? Um, all right. So thank you for those of you who have voted. We've gotten in a bunch. Some of the, this clearly seems to be a little bit of indecision, but the runaway winner seems to be there will be specific clauses to protect labor in deals. Ed, is that how you see it? What, what's your interpretation? Um, I see. There are already actually specific clauses to uh, protect labor in, in deals. That, uh, there have been labor con you know, criteria in trade agreements really back to um, the U.S.-Jordan Agreement in 2010 and labor-related issues in the NAFTA as well. Um, so that's definitely part of it. I think you know, part of the administration's goal is that um, when it does agreements, it will definitely want to have quite uh, extensive labor provision. Um, they have focused a lot in USMCA implementation on one quite new thing called rapid response mechanism, which deals with uh, labor rights in individual facilities. Uh, but I would say a couple of things. One, one of the ways Ambassador Tai, I think, personally judges trade policy is, can you look at individuals as workers, as consumers, and see our work is helping them? And that is something that's very much on her mind. Uh, second is that the administration has put a lot of emphasis and I think will continue on elimination of forced labor in international supply chains. So there are a number of things that are consistent from probably amplified from previous agreements. There are a number of things that are particular to the administration's policy agenda. And there's, I think, a, a way that they're hoping to be able to judge the outcomes of agreements that uh, together make up this worker-centric concept. So that's useful. Scott, what, what, how do you interpret this? Is this a useful approach to, to trade, a useful and different approach to trade policy making? Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, I'm pretty skeptical uh, of the approach. Um, I, I, it strikes me as more uh, marketing than, than much of anything. I mean, I think Ed's right that that's where they're looking, um, more enforcement of uh, the labor provisions um, and, and on the forced labor side. But uh, it honestly, it strikes me a lot as uh, an excuse for not striking deals at all. So I'll take uh, point E. Um, and an excuse just to implement the type of protectionism that you see in the EU steel deal and the Japan steel deal and the rest. And the problem, I mean, I think as a Cato guy, I have to say this, but uh, free trade is pro-worker. Uh, it's, it's, this strikes me as a worker-centric trade policy is, is pro-some workers. And it's pro the workers that the Biden administration is speaking to. Um, it is not helpful, on the other hand, for workers in, say, the construction industry or in all sorts of other industries that need access to freely traded, uh, low priced inputs across the supply chain. So, um, but look, I get it. And I think, you know, Ed's point from, from earlier is very important and correct that. The Biden administration is trying to balance all sorts of different interests. I don't think they see trade policy as a priority. Domestic policy is the priority. And thus, this is a bit of a way to try to square the circle in the Democratic Party and keep that train moving forward um, while not being overtly Trumpian protectionist. OK, thank you for that. So listen, you know, uh, We've run out of time before we've run out of long before we've run out of interesting subjects to talk about. One thing I was remiss in not sort of mentioning earlier to our audience is that both of you write about this stuff and you write very well about these things and you, you put out interesting stuff. So we're going to send around at least, I think, one link to you know, this. I should say this was inspired in part by Scott actually writing a nice overview of where he thought all this stuff was. We will send a link to that. But you can find Scott's writings on this at Cato. And you can find Ed stuff at the Progressive Policy Institute, and I highly recommend them. Um, I I try to stay informed as best I can by reading what what these guys have to say because they're fantastic. Thank you both for for joining us and and sharing your wisdom and all this. Um, 
for all the rest of you, all of you who have joined us today, um, there's an on-demand version of this webinar that will be available shortly after we conclude, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. With that, thank you very much for joining us, and please stay safe.